Oh well, hello there. Um, so I'm still in bed to try to <clears throat> make myself look as pathetic as I possibly can. Get some sympathy points for you guys. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so we left off. Uh, we had just started chapter 29 or chapter um, 10, I think it is, 10 or 11. Uh, the one that's on energy flow and nutrient cycling and ecosystems. Um, so in the lab, we had covered the first couple of slides. We talked about the sockeye salmon and how they affect the nutrient cycle in their ecosystems. Um, we had already uh, gone ahead and defined uh, an ecosystem, both uh, having abiotic and biotic components. And we talked about uh, nutrients cycling within and across ecosystems, but energy always flowing unidirectionally, unidirectionally through uh, an ecosystem, right? So it goes up the food web or up the food chain from uh, the producers all the way up to the, uh, you know, tertiary consumers, quaternary consumers, whatever, the, the peak carnivores. And then finally uh, stops and ends in the detritivores and decomposers. Um, so this is that cycle, um, and this is the last slide we left off on um, during lab. Okay, so we see energy flowing in those red arrows, and that's flowing through the food web and ending up in the detritivores and decomposers, and then you see there's no red arrow at the end. Okay, so it's not uh, feeding back into the cycle. Right, so the question becomes, where did it go? Where did all the energy go? <clears throat> and we'll talk more about that in detail um, as the lecture goes on. Nutrients, however, are totally conserved in the, the system. Um, so you have the purple arrows, and they're going, they're returning back to the producers after they go through all of these food webs, right? So not every nutrient or energy unit has to go from producer to primary consumer to secondary consumer and so on, right? You can go through the producers and then end up right in the detritivores, or them through the primary consumers and end up right in the detritivores, etc. Right? So there are actually a whole bunch of little sub-cycles within this cycle, if that makes sense. Right, so we've talked about nutrients and we've talked about energy. Um, <clears throat> let's formalize what we mean by a nutrient. So a nutrient is any atom or molecule that an organism obtains from the environment. Um, and again, these are, are conserved within cycle, uh, within uh, food webs, right? So literally the very same nutrient, the very same water, carbon dioxide, et cetera, et cetera, that's been sustaining life on Earth for all three billion years at least that there's been life on Earth, um, haven't, haven't changed, right? We haven't added new nutrients to these cycles, um, you know, absent the occasional asteroid that that can add new things to the Earth. The Earth is a, a pretty closed system in terms of nutrients, right? In terms of energy, it's not, as we've talked about in class before. <clears throat> but this is kind of profound, right? That means that there are atoms of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, etc., in your body that were once part of dinosaurs or woolly mammoths, um, uh, which is pretty amazing, right? You're stardust. Um, so the nutrients get transferred around the planet, but they never leave the planet, right? Except for satellites or space stations, you know, it's very rare. <clears throat> okay, energy, as we discussed, takes a one-way journey through ecosystems. Um, so it's captured initially by anything that can photosynthesize. So whether that's cyanobacteria or algae or plants, doesn't matter. Those are the first things that harvest that energy, and everything else has to eat them to acquire that energy. Um, so <clears throat> eventually, right, if you were to stop the input of more energy from the sun, all of life's energy would eventually be converted to heat um, and wouldn't be usable to drive more chemical reactions. So life requires continuous input of energy from the sun. 
so I tried to like find a Google image that I made a joke about the heat death of the universe. Um, you know, to, to kind of riff on the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and this is the best cartoon I could find. So feel free to pause, laugh, roll your eyes, etc. Okay, um, so that's it for bullet point one. Uh, so we've talked about nutrients and energy moving through ecosystems. Now we'll talk about how energy flows through ecosystems in a little bit more detail. Later on, we'll talk about nutrient cycling, and then we'll talk about how humans have affected the cycles. Okay, how does energy fl flow through ecosystems? So originally, <clears throat> all of the energy comes from the sun, right? So the sun is just a ball of gas with a lot of thermonuclear reactions um, that are transforming matter into a lot of energy. Um, so that energy is radiating from the sun in all directions, and a tiny little fraction of that energy reaches the earth, right, which is quite a distance away. <clears throat> and that energy is exists in the form of electromagnetic waves. So electromagnetic waves, um, depending on the wavelength, can be heat, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet light, etc. Microwave, radio, gamma. Um, so about half of the energy that it reaches Earth is on the visible light spectrum. Um, so the fate of any particular unit of ultraviolet, or sorry, of uh, um, electromagnetic radiation, um, <clears throat> once it hits the planet, uh, it can either be reflected right back into space, um, which is what happens to much of it, right? It either gets reflected by the atmosphere or hits some molecule in the clouds um, and then reflects back off into space. Um, but some subset uh, uh, gets to the surface and then just hits the surface and bounces back into space. Um, so the only the only uh, radiation that that is retained on the planet as energy uh, is that small fraction that reaches the surface and gets captured by a photosynthetic organism. <clears throat> so speaking of photosynthetic organisms, um, in addition to capturing these photons, right, these units of electromagnetic radiation on the visible light spectrum, um, plants have to, plants or other photosynthetic organisms have to acquire other nutrients, um, right, because there's other inputs in that photosynthesis reaction, right? So they actually need carbon, oxygen, also phosphorus and nitrogen um, from the their abiotic ecosystem, right? So you can't just grow plants on concrete, right? They need all of these nutrients in the soil. And then they're just like these little chemical apothecaries as organisms, right? So they can convert atmospheric carbon into these complex organic molecules like glucose that are much more usable by other organisms. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the food chain and the food web. Um, so let's start with defining a new term, which is trophic level. So trophic level is a category of organisms um, through which energy passes. So you could think about this as a link on a food chain or maybe a step on a, a food web. Um, so the first, the bottom link of any uh, ecosystem, right, the bottom component of the food chain um, is the first trophic level, right? The, the name of the organisms on the first trophic level of an ecosystem are, uh, is a producer. Right. Um, sometimes you'll hear autotrophs. So that word troph um, basically means feeding. So autotrophs are can feed themselves. So these are the photosynthesizers. So they make their own food using inorganic nutrients and solar energy. 
So depending on the ecosystem, these would be plants in most terrestrial ecosystems and either algae or photosynthesizing bacteria in marine or freshwater ecosystems. Um, all of the other trophic levels are consumers or heterotrophs, right? So hetero meaning different, troph meaning feed, so they have to eat something else. Um, and there are actually a different levels of consumers, as we'll see in a second, but all of them acquire energy and nutrients from molecules in bodies of other organisms. Okay, so here's our adorable chipmunk picture. Okay, uh, so there are several trophic levels of consumers. Um, the first trophic level of consumers, which is the second trophic level overall, are primary consumers. So these are the ones that feed exclusively or directly on producers. So they eat photosynthetic things. So another word for that is herbivore. Um, so depending on the ecosystem, this could be grasshoppers, mice, zebras, um, zooplankton in marine ecosystems. Okay, so here's a terrifying image of uh, locusts uh, in East Africa. They are primary consumers. Okay, the next trophic level we have are uh, secondary consumers. So these are the things that eat herbivores. Okay, um, so uh, we call these carnivores, right? So things like spiders, hawks, salmon um, would be uh, um, consumers, right? Or would be carnivores, sorry. And depending on whether they eat uh, only herbivores, they would be uh, a second secondary consumers. Or if they eat other carnivores, they would be tertiary consumers, or in some cases, quaternary consumers. So a good example of this would be a fox, right? So a fox is eating... Uh, an herbivore here, um, so that's a secondary consumer. <clears throat> okay, so if you think about it, if you have a tertiary consumer, it needs enough secondary consumer to subsist on. And those secondary consumers need enough primary consumers to subsist on. And those primary consumers need enough producers to subsist on. So everything depends on the amount of uh, energy and biomass that's accumulated by the producers. Okay? And the word for that is net primary production. Okay, so net primary production is the energy that photosynthetic organisms store in their body over some given period of time, right? So maybe a year, let's say. Okay, uh, another maybe uh, more common word uh, meaning the same thing, right? Or uh, um, as net primary production, or the easiest way to measure net primary production is by calculating biomass. Biomass is just uh, the, the amount of dry biological material um, that is stored in the organism's body. Right, so if you dehydrate some strawberries and then weigh them, that's the biomass that a strawberry produced. Right, so it's just convention that we don't include water um, in that uh, in that measurement um, because uh, the amount of water in an organism can change even over the course of a couple hours. So uh, it makes more sense to 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 weigh the dry material. So if we were to look at go away, sorry. If we were to look at a chart um, that has different ecosystems here um, and uh, indicates in black the number of grams per square meter per year of biomass produced by these ecosystems, we see a lot of variation, right? We see uh, in deserts, right, the biomass in grams per square meter per year is about 90 grams. In the open ocean, it's 125. In the tundra, it's 140, right? And then when we get to 
places like estuarine habitats, right, which are where fresh water meets salt water, or even tropical rainforests, uh, these are much more productive ecosystems, right? So they're making much more, in some cases, orders of magnitude more biomass um, per year than some other ecosystems. So my question to you, uh, since we don't have partners today, is why are tropical rainforests much more productive ecosystems than, say, tundra? Okay, so pause the talk, think about that for a second. Try to answer out loud, right? Just humor me. That's a, it's a really good way to learn, right? To either write it out or speak it, right? Because you don't know whether you understand it unless you actually try to communicate it with someone else. If you think that you understand it in your head, it's very easy to trick yourself into thinking you know something that you don't. Okay, so definitely do pause it and actually go through the motions here. Welcome back. Okay, so um, you've taken some time to try to figure out why this is the case, right? And the, the reason is because these ecosystems don't have the same amount of inputs, right? They vary in the amount of sunlight that hits that part of the world, right? So equator, the equator is literally closer to the sun than any other part of the world. Um, so depending on time of day, right, as the Earth is rotating, the equator is going to be the closest thing to the sun. Um, so the amount of sunlight matters. The availability of water and other nutrients, so nutrients including water, are not uniformly distributed across the planet, right? So there's much less water in deserts, say, than there is in tropical rainforests. Temperature matters, right? The speed of all of those metabolic reactions and therefore the amount of energy that a photosynthetic organism can acquire per unit time is greater in areas where there's higher temperature, right? There's just more kinetic energy, so you can ramp, go through those reactions faster. Okay, so for example, in the desert, right, lack of water is the thing that's probably going to limit production. In the ocean, right, um, most of the organism, right, or sorry, um, most of the ocean doesn't have access to light, right? So photons only penetrate the, you know, the first couple of meters, I don't actually know the number, um, but after that, photons just don't reach deeper in, in the water. Um, so most of the ocean, right, the deep ocean, is not very productive because it's limited by the amount of light input. Okay, so tropical rainforests just happen to be in the parts of the world that have access to all of these nutrients all, you know, ideal temperature, etc., cetera, um, to facilitate more metabolism, more reactions, more photosynthesis. Okay. So despite this, um, ocean, so it matters also how much land area a particular ecosystem occupies, right? So even though oceans have very low net primary production, they are collectively a fourth of the Earth's total production. And that's because they cover 70% of the planet's surface. All right, so we've been flirting with this idea of a food chain um, for a little while when we were talking about trophic levels. Um, so now let's talk about that in some more detail. <clears throat> a food chain is a linear relationship um, between different trophic levels of organisms. Okay. Uh, so the first chain on any food uh, on any food chain, the first link is going to be a, pro a producer. Right, that's the first trophic level. And then the next link is going to be a primary consumer, so an herbivore, which is the second trophic level. After that, you're going to have secondary consumers, which are the third trophic level. And then you're going to have tertiary consumers, which are the fourth trophic level, etc., etc. Right, so in this way, plants support plant-eating insects, reptiles, birds, mammals, each of which can be preyed on by other animals. So here's an example of a terrestrial 
food chain, right, where we have an oak tree and then a caterpillar and then a robin, it looks like, and then a hawk. Um, in marine ecosystems, you also have food chains, right? The producers in this case are phytoplankton, so they're just small um, photosynthesizing protists or bacteria or algae. Second uh, trophic level are the primary consumers, the zooplankton. Third trophic level are the secondary consumers, so these are fish that eat zooplankton. Uh, fourth trophic level are the tertiary consumers, <clears throat> so these are fish that eat other fish. And then uh, in some cases you can have quaternary consumers, which are occupy the fifth trophic level, which would be sharks that eat fish that eat fish. So phytoplankton is just a word that collectively refers to all of these photosynthetic organisms. Zooplankton is a word that collectively refers to all of these different invertebrates that eat zooplankton, uh, phytoplankton. Okay, so they're all shrimp-like crustaceans, jellyfish, etc. Okay, so a food chain is a little bit of an overly simplistic model. Um, right, so you have animals like humans that actually sample from several different levels in the food chain. Okay, so then the question becomes, well, where do they fit into the food chain? Right, if we eat plants, does that make us primary consumers? What if we eat hawks? Um, so uh, omnivores, right, are kind of throw a gum in the works of, of a, this concept of a food chain. Right, so uh, the more modern concept is a food web, right? So there are often these interconnected relationships between different trophic levels. Okay, so it's not really chain-like. The concept of a trophic level still makes sense um, in terms of how much biomass you would expect to find at each trophic level. Um, but it's worth thinking or considering the fact that some organisms can sample from several different trophic levels. And by sample, I mean eat. Okay. So here's an example of a food, a food web in a grassland. <clears throat> um, and the difference between a food web and a food chain is immediately apparent because now you have arrows going every which way from a lot of different organisms. Um, so for example, um, you have <clears throat> uh, organisms like wolves, right, that are, are not just eating one kind of consumer, right, they are eating different various kinds of grazers, they're eating um, small mammals, large mammals, etc. Trying to find a good example of an organism that's sampling from several different trophic levels. Okay, here's a good example. It's ground nesting owl, right? It's eating a lot of primary consumers, right, so a lot of herbivores, right, but you also see this owl eating this snake. Oh, I'm just kidding, the snake is eating the owl. Oh, the snake is eating the owl eggs. Okay, so the snake is a good example, right, so it's eating a lot of primary consumers, right, things that are herbivores, but it's also eating owls, which are secondary consumers. Okay, so here's an example of an omnivore in this, uh, in this food web. Okay, by the way, these red arrows are depicting energy, not nutrient transfer. And the way that you can tell that is because there are no arrows exiting um, from the detritivores and decomposers. So speaking of, let's talk about what those are. So detritivores and decomposers uh, recycle nutrients in ecosystems. Um, so detritivore is something that eats debris. Um, so these are mostly um, small 
organisms that don't get a lot of attention, like earthworms or nematode worms or millipedes or beetles. Um, but there are a couple of large ones, like vultures. Um, and this is contrasted with decomposers, which are primarily fungi and bacteria. Um, the difference between a detritivore and a decomposer is a decomposer doesn't ingest, doesn't like put the chunk of organic material into its body. Instead, it secretes digestive enzymes outside of its body, breaks them down, and then absorbs those nutrients. Um, so decomposers and detritivores do feed on the same material. So you often find them together. Okay, so my next question for you guys is, what would happen to an ecosystem in the absence of detritivores and decomposers? So pause this, think about it, tell it out loud, tell it to your roommate, talk to a rubber duck, whatever, write it down. All right, welcome back. So let's talk about what would happen. Um, as, as it happens, we actually have some examples of this occurring in nature. Um, so the question was, what would happen to an ecosystem in the absence of detritivores and decomposers, right? Um, this is a picture of the famous red forest in Chernobyl, right? So Chernobyl um, uh, was the site of a really famous uh, nu nuclear reactor meltdown. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of radiation contamination. People aren't allowed to live in this zone, right? But bunches of organisms still live there. You can't stop them from living there. Um, but the ecosystem is very drastically altered. And probably the most noticeable thing about the ecosystem <clears throat> is that there are there's dead organic material, like trees, um, that haven't decomposed for almost two decades. Um, so there, there are all these dead logs um, that have just not been decomposed. Um, so what's happening in these ecosystems is that that biomass, right, all of these nutrients aren't being reclaimed and can't be used for new photosynthetic organisms, right? Um, so uh, what they think is happening is that the tritivores are definitely uh, not as numerous, but the biggest culprit is uh, decomposers are, are either not as numerous or not performing their function correctly because of the radiation contamination. Um, so essentially what's been happening over these past two decades is this biomass of primary uh, of production has been accumulating, right? So you just have this leaf litter that's increasing in size over time and not being broken down into its like basic components. Um, so the big concern now is that there's just going to be this crazy forest fire um, because there's so many dead leaves um, and dead material. And that forest fire, they're worried, is going to disperse a lot of that radiation contamination over uh, into other ecosystems. Um, so that's pretty much what would happen, right? Is eventually if you waited long enough and decomposition continued not to happen in this ecosystem, you would not expect there to be new life. Um, just because all the nutrients are locked up in the dead material and they can't get recycled back. So eventually there just won't be enough nutrients for new plants to grow. All right. So we've talked about food webs and food chains and um, it may be intuitive to you to realize that things that are really high up on the food chain, right, so high up in the trophic levels for tertiary consumers, etc., are much less common than things at the base of the food chain, right, the producers. And the reason for that is because energy transfer between trophic levels is inefficient, right? And inefficiency, indeed, is just a rule in living systems. Um, you can't convert energy uh, without having some kind of waste heat. Um, so biochemical reactions, as we've talked about in class before, are very inefficient. 
Um, so the result of this is that most of the energy stored in one trophic level, like producers, isn't available to organisms in the next trophic level. Okay. Um, so let's uh, use an example of a bird eating a grasshopper. Okay. So all of the energy stored in that grasshopper is not going to be available to the bird that eats it. Right? And the reason for that is because the grasshopper has expended some of that energy hopping away, flying, trying to eat. Okay, so it's wasted energy or used energy metabolizing. Um, some of that energy is stored in molecules that can't be digested by the bird. Right? So birds have a lot of trouble digesting a grasshopper's exoskeleton. And then finally, the lion's share of that energy gets lost as heat, right? So as the bird is trying to metabolize, right, there's just a lot of heat produced that doesn't get used. Um, so there's a, the rule of thumb, right, or this 10% law. Basically, when you're trying to calculate the energy transfer between trophic levels, it's about 10% efficient. So 90% of the energy is lost from one trophic level to the next. Okay, it's probably easiest to visualize this. So if we have a thousand calories of producer in that first trophic level, we would only expect 10% of that energy to end up as primary consumer. All right, so a thousand calories should be able to support a hundred calories worth of uh, consumer, uh, grasshopper in this case. Those hundred calories should be able to support 10 calories of, of bird. Okay, and that 10 calories of bird should support one calorie of hawk. All right, next activity, pause it for a sec. Question is, the most common animals in a community are blank. Okay, welcome back. Um, most common animals in a community are going to be the primary consumers, right, so the herbivores. Um, the reason for this is because if they're animals, you know they're not producers. So we're not talking about plants, algae. We're talking about animals. And there are more calories available for primary consumers than there are for secondary consumers, etc. Okay. So the other thing that you see, the other pattern that you see as you move up this um, these trophic levels is that Anything that doesn't get digested but still gets stored in the biological material, often fats of these organisms, accumulates over time. Okay, So we see a lot of uh, toxins. Um, so mercury is probably the most famous one. Um, accumulating uh, at higher and higher concentrations the further up the food chain you go. Okay, So this is uh, a process is known as uh, biological magnification or bioaccumulation you also hear um, and it can have pretty harmful effects right so this is why if you're pregnant you're not supposed to eat high trophic level fish right so things like um, mackerel and uh, swordfish right because these are predators that have eaten fish that have eaten fish etc Right, so they've accumulated a lot of mercury because that mercury doesn't get metabolized. <clears throat> right, so if you have a, as a, um, I, I can never think of this fish. Okay, well, we'll just say mackerel then. If you as a mackerel have eaten hundreds of other fish, then you've acquired and accumulated all of that mercury 